So good afternoon and welcome to Alumni Weekend. I'd like to remind you at the outset to turn off your cell phones and pagers. So each year, the Yale Law School Association presents the Award of Merit to an esteemed alumnus, and it is the school's very highest honor. The award recognizes an individual's contributions to the law and to the legal profession, as well as to the wider society that each serves. Past honorees have included Supreme Court Justices Potter Stewart and Byron Wright, and Presidents Gerald Ford and Bill Clinton. Today, I have the formidable responsibility of introducing this year's honoree, a task that is made more daunting by the fact that the luster of certain individuals shines so brightly that nothing can seem to add to it. But I, I can say this, I can say that when Secretary Clinton left the Obama administration earlier this year, certain pundits did speculate that she might sometime soon seek to add one last elusive line to her resume. And I'm very happy to say that today, with this award, we can prove them right. <laughs> so, there's no better place to begin than with Secretary Clinton's own words. When she returned to Yale Law School to speak at Alumni Weekend in 1992, that's 21 years ago, Secretary Clinton, then the First Lady of Arkansas, told us, and I'm quoting her now, Part of the great message of this law school is that being a lawyer means many different things. It means being an advocate, a legislator, an executive. It means being a practitioner and using one's skills in a variety of areas. It means being a teacher. It means taking the lessons we have been taught and using them to help further the goals of society as we see them. So very few lawyers today can credibly claim to have filled each of these roles in the course of a career. But in the four decades since she left this place, Secretary Clinton has indeed been an advocate, a practitioner, a legislator in the Senate, an executive in the State Department, and a teacher to the nation and to the world. In 1969, Hillary Rodham was one of just 27 women in her class of 235 matriculating students. The Yale Law School was then an even more eccentric place than it is now. <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Professor Charles Reich had encamped with some students in a makeshift tent in the courtyard. And the Hog Farm commune, traveling in their psychedelic bus, had come to visit the Sterling Law dorms. And that was a period in which even the official history of the law school calls it the Dark Ages. <laughs> but a light shone in those Dark Ages. At Yale, Hillary became a powerful and effective advocate for social justice. She studied child development at the Yale Child Study Center. She consulted with the staff of the Yale New Haven Hospital on child abuse cases. She volunteered at the New Haven Legal Assistance Association to provide legal advice to indigent clients and to young children. Speaking to the American Bar Association this past summer, Secretary Clinton recalled, and I'm quoting her, although the work I did at New Haven Legal Assistance sometimes felt a million miles away from the classrooms where we debated precedents and procedures, it helped me see lawyers giving life to the concepts in my textbooks using them to solve real problems facing people every day. So those real problems and those real people have been the constant preoccupation of Secretary Clinton since she left the law school. In her remarks at Alumni Weekend in 1992, Secretary Clinton noted that more than one third of the children in New Haven were then living in poverty. She said, quoting her, the problems around us may not be so visible, but they are eating away at the quality of our lives together. And to me, the key word in that sentence is together. 
this awareness and compassion, this keen appreciation of interdependence have virtually defined the career of Secretary Clinton. In the decades following her graduation, she would make compassionate and constructive history over and over again. As a staff attorney par excellence at Marion Wright Edelman's newly created Children's Defense Fund, as a member of the impeachment staff, advising the House Judiciary Committee during the Watergate scandal, as a co-founder of Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families, and as the first woman chair of the Legal Services Corporation, as the first woman to become a partner at the storied Rose Law Firm, the oldest firm west of the Mississippi, as a first lady of Arkansas who became a determined and effective advocate for education reform, as a first lady of the United States who tirelessly worked on the front lines as an advocate for families and health care, and who formed one half of perhaps the greatest political partnership this country has ever witnessed. calling to mind the days of Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt. As a United States Senator, a legislator who tenaciously served the diverse constituencies of her state, both urban and rural, and who after tremendous labor in the years after 9-11, worked to secure funds to rebuild New York, to provide compensation to the victims, and to provide remedial attention to the first responders who worked at Ground Zero in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy. Most recently, of course, we've witnessed her performance as one of the great secretaries of state in this nation's history. After only one year in office, there were, all, there were already more female ambassadors in place than at any point in United States history. And in the State Department, <laughs> and in the State Department, they call that the Hillary effect. In her four years at the State Department, she visited 112 countries, took part in some 1,700 meetings with world leaders, and logged a staggering total of 956,733 miles. <laughs> to speak of her tenure at the State Department is to speak of the course of global affairs during the last four years, from China to Russia, from Egypt to Libya, from Iraq to Afghanistan. We saw progress toward democratic reforms in Burma, and she was the first to visit there, the first visit by a Secretary of State from this country since, 1990, since 1955. She integrated everything from traditional diplomacy to new media, to development aid, to military expertise, to public-private networks to create something called smart power. And it was smart indeed. There's one particular snapshot from her time as secretary that I think crisply captures the courage that is characteristic of her career, as well as her incredible gift as a teacher. Two years ago, Secretary Clinton delivered an unexpected but extraordinary address to the United Nations Human Rights Council in defense of gay rights around the world. And the core of her message was this, gay rights are human rights and human rights are gay rights. But her message was delivered with such eloquence and such candor that its lesson will never be forgotten. Let me read you some of the words she said to that council. She said, it is a violation of human rights when people are beaten or killed because of their sexual orientation or because they do not conform to cultural norms about how men and women should look or behave. It is a violation of human rights when governments declare it illegal to be gay or allow those who harm gay people to go unpunished. It is a violation of human rights when lesbian or transgendered women are subjected to so-called corrective rape or forcibly subjected to hormone treatments. And it is a violation of human rights when life-saving care is withheld from people because they are gay, or equal access to justice is denied to people because they are gay, or public spaces are out of bounds to people because they are gay. No matter what we look like, where we come from, or who we are, we are all equally entitled to our human rights and dignity. 
Schwarz. You can feel the power of those words. And she made such a strong case in front of the potentially hostile Human Rights Council, such a persuasive case that no representatives of the 47 member nations walked out. And indeed, she received a standing ovation. And in a world of Russian repression, that is no small feat. And you should know that her speech chimed with an equally daring and equally memorable and effective address that she had given in Beijing 20 years before to the effect that women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. During, during the course of her entire career, Secretary Clinton has drawn liberally from her roots at Yale. The law school has benefited from her affection. Her close relationship to my predecessor, the great Harold Coe, is exemplary. But Harold is, in truth, just one of many, many members of the Yale Law community whom Secretary Clinton has brought within her orbit throughout her career, from Neera Tanden to Karen Dunn to Jake Sullivan to Ronan Farrow to that guy with the white hair and the saxophone. <laughs> In recognizing Secretary Clinton with the Award of Merit, therefore, we pay tribute not just to her own work as a magnificent Yale alumna, but also to the contributions that she has enabled so many others to make. She has changed the world herself, and she has also provided a platform for other members of our community to do the same. After eight years in the White House, six in the Senate, and four more at Foggy Bottom, Secretary Clinton seems to have decided that for her, for, for her there is still plenty to change in the world. She has become a fierce and leading advocate in the global fight to end elephant poaching, for example. And just a few months ago, she launched a new early childhood initiative called Too Small to Fail, which will seek to improve the health and welfare of children during their first five years. As Secretary Clinton has aptly noted, quoting her, one of the best investments we can make as a nation is to give our kids the ingredients they need to develop in the first five years of life. And so what began more than 40 years ago when Hillary Rodham went to work at the Yale Child Study Center continues now more eloquently than ever before. In the late 1860s, Otto von Bismarck described politics famously as the art of the possible. A century later, shortly before Secretary Clinton arrived at the Yale Law School, she gave the student address at her 1969 graduation from Wellesley College. And she said, quote, the challenge now is to practice politics as the art of making what appears to be impossible, possible. In her decades of public service, Secretary Clinton has accepted that challenge and miraculously she has met it. She has proved Bismarck wrong. She has become, throughout the many chapters of her career, one of the truly great stewards of our national trust. As a practitioner, an advocate, a legislator, an executive, a leader, and as a teacher, she has proved Bismarck wrong time and again. She has made the impossible possible, and she has become a great champion of our national aspirations and ideals. For the extent of her achievements and the power of her example, and for the dazzling future we know is yet to come, please join me in welcoming the recipient of the 2013 Yale Law School Association Award of Merit, Hillary Rodham Clinton.
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Post, for those much too generous words, but that walk down memory lane that uh, you just provided me. I also want to thank President Salovey. Thank you very much as well, Mr. President, and everyone at the law school and the university for this extraordinary honor. It has gone to many lawyers and leaders who I respect and admire, including the one I am married to. So I am deeply humbled to stand in their company. I also want to acknowledge Senator Dick Blumenthal, who is here. I thank you so much, Dick, and your family. And keep up the good fight on behalf of the people of Connecticut. I'm also told that former Senator John Danforth is here, and I wanted to acknowledge him and thank him for his, his years of leadership and stewardship. I look out at this audience and I see so many friends and colleagues. I could keep you here for many hours telling you stories, only if you swear not to take them out of the room. But I want to acknowledge uh, Harold Coe. Yes, he was your former dean. He, he, he was also my State Department legal advisor. And Harold and I had a lot of adventures over the past four years, uh, from negotiating the freedom of a blind Chinese dissident to co-starring in a photo that became a viral internet sensation. <laughs> now, the meme was called Text from Hillary, but Harold is right there with me. <laughs> Depending upon the angle, his eyes are either open or shut. <laughs> but I understand that he's thinking of capitalizing on his newfound celebrity by teaching a class called Texts from Herald, Statutes in 140 Characters or Less. <laughs> if anyone could do it, Harold could. Now, just out of the frame of that photo on the C-130 uh, is Jake Sullivan, class of 03, who is also here <laughs> celebrating his 10th reunion after four years and nearly a million miles by my side at the State Department, Jake is now National Security Advisor to Vice President Biden. So if Vice President Biden starts wearing pantsuits and scrunchies, <laughs> I think we know who to blame, but I greatly appreciate all of you who have been part of the journey that uh, Bill and I have been on most particularly the class of 1973, our friends and colleagues, and also some from 72, which is where I started. It is really hard to believe, as I look at some of the students uh, in the audience, that it's been 40 years. I remember the first time I arrived on campus in 1969, I was driving a beat-up old car. I had a mattress tied to the roof. I was wearing my bell-bottoms, and I'm so grateful there was no internet or phone cameras in those days. <laughs> I was, as Dean Post said, one of 27 women out of 235 law students. There was a camp set up in the square at the law school, the, the common, it was not quite clear what it was for, but it seemed to fit right in with the mood of the time. It was a tumultuous time in America, in New Haven, and at Yale. And the students were drawn in. We had a lot of late night, heated arguments over the future of the country. We even challenged each other whether going to law school at such a time was a morally defensible choice. 
In other words, were we selling out? What would we do with the rest of our lives? Thanks to the steady leadership of President Kingman Brewster, who suspended classes during the worst of the unrest and opened the dorms to anyone who needed a meal, there was on the campus at least some feeling that we could get through this together. Those were the days of Reverend William Sloan Coffin, one of the most articulate voices of the anti-war movement. The law school dean, Dean Lewis Pollock, urged us to organize student patrols after the International Law Library was actually set on fire. And I remember being part of the bucket brigade trying to save those priceless materials. So the times themselves certainly left indelible memories, but it was my professors and my classmates who most influenced me and shaped the kind of lawyer I became and the choices that I made. I took fascinating, challenging classes. I made a lot of friends, and one day, cutting through what was then the student lounge with some of those friends my second year, I heard a voice say, and not only that, we grow the biggest watermelons in the world. <laughs> I grew up outside of Chicago. I, I, I said, who is that? And the answer was, that's Bill Clinton. He's from Arkansas, and that's all he ever talks about. <laughs> so I was curious. Those were the days when he looked like a Viking from Arkansas. And we kept kind of looking at each other. You know, I'd walk by on the street or in the hallway, and I'd look at him, and he'd look back. But we'd never been properly introduced. So one day in the law library, I was looking at him, and he was looking at me. We were both supposed to be studying, of course. So I got up and I walked over and I said, if you're gonna keep looking at me and I'm going to keep looking back, we at least ought to be introduced. I'm Hillary Rodham, who are you? Now, you know, Bill tells a much better story. He says, well, I totally forgot my name. <laughs> <laughs> but he quickly recovered and we had a conversation that started that day and has continued to this one. I want just briefly to share a few of the lessons that I learned outside of the classroom that continue to influence how I see the world and the challenges facing our country. Now, it was here, as Dean Post referenced, that I developed a lifelong passion about children's welfare. And I learned that if you want to know about the moral, economic, and social health of a community, look at the children. It all began with a little flyer on the law school bulletin board outside the registrar's office. Now, I haven't been over there on this trip, so I don't know if there are still those flyers, but we used to study them like we were studying the Talmud, because you never knew what you'd find on that bulletin board you might find a note saying, would anyone like to take a course next year about the legal, ecological challenges of the Central African forest? I mean, that was Yale. And there was always somebody willing to teach it and to take it. Well, that day, I saw a little note about a woman named Marion Wright Edelman who was going to lecture on campus. I had just read about her in Time magazine. She was a 1963 graduate of the law school and the first African-American woman admitted to the Mississippi bar. She was a lawyer for the NAACP in Jackson. She was a friend of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy. She was an altogether remarkable person. So I went over to hear her speak and I was captivated. 
She talked about the political importance of taking care of kids and why she, as a Yale Law School graduate, was focused on starting a Head Start program in Mississippi. How she wanted to use her Yale education on behalf of poor children. Something just clicked with me and I went up to her afterwards and I said, I really want to come to work for you this summer. And she said, that's great, but I have no money to pay you. And I was paying my way through law school and I had to make some money, so I went back to the registrar's office and started looking around for something that could pay my way and I discovered the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council gave out grants. So I applied for one and I got it. And because of that, I was able to spend the summer of 1970 researching the plight of children of migrant farm workers who often lived without the basics of housing and sanitation. It was an eye-opening experience and I returned to Yale that fall with a new sense of focus and mission. I had two professors, Jay Katz and Joe Goldstein, who encouraged my interest in how the law could better protect children and families and suggested that I spend time at the Yale Child Study Center. So I began to do so, attending case discussions, observing clinical sessions, getting to know the incredible Dr. Sally Province, a pioneer in early childhood development who helped stressed out parents understand that talking and reading lovingly to your babies, even when they were far too young to talk to you, would have lasting benefits. And this was before all the brain science. This was just understanding the absolute imperative of human connections with our youngest people. That insight really was driven home to me when I started consulting with the medical staff at Yale New Haven Hospital about child abuse. Child abuse was just being recognized as a problem in the early 1970s. I accompanied doctors on their rounds. I was just a law student, but I was interested, so they treated me like I knew something, and I would be asked, well, so what do we do? What's the law on this, and is there any law that we should be consulting? I saw children who'd been beaten and burned, who'd been left alone for days in squalid apartments, who didn't get the medical care they needed in a timely way. And I remember one father who brought in his badly injured three-year-old claiming that he had to beat the boy to get the devil out of him. Now, I'm sure there was child abuse and domestic violence when I was growing up, but I didn't see it and it wasn't covered in the press, so it was a hidden, silent problem like so many others. And I began to see how the health and well-being of children was a real window into the health and well-being of our country. Kids were the canaries in the proverbial coal mine. And if you want to understand, even today, how economic dislocation of the past dozen years has affected American life, look at our children. More than 16 million American kids live in poverty today, the highest percentage since the early 1990s. Nearly half of all recipients of food stamps are children, 22 million of them. And yes, the overall poverty rate here in New Haven is just over 25%, but for children, it's nearly 38%, and in Hartford, Connecticut, it's more than 50%. Just think about that for a moment. Connecticut is one of our wealthiest states, and more than half the children in its capital live in poverty. If you want to understand our health challenges, many of which are correlated to economic troubles, look again at our children. The prevalence of chronic conditions like obesity, asthma, behavioral, and learning problems among American children has more than doubled in the past two decades. And despite all of the advances that we have made, babies in America today are more likely to be born underweight and undernourished than they were in 1990. 
If you even want to understand the human costs of political brinksmanship and gridlock in Washington, look at the children. Because of the government shutdown, nearly nine million women and children will soon be unable to buy healthy food and baby formula through the special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children. Already, nearly 19,000 low-income children younger than five can no longer attend Head Start programs, and that's on top of the 57,000 children who have been turned away because of the sequester. So if you really want to understand what this means when we talk about growing inequality and shrinking social and economic mobility that is undermining America's ideal of equal opportunity for all, look at the children. I was very struck by the important new research coming from Robert Putnam. He finished his PhD in political science here at Yale when I arrived for law school. He later earned acclaim for his work on the changing nature of America's civic engagement and community networks in his seminal uh, study called Bowling Alone. Now, Dr. Putnam is studying today how economic pressures on parents translate into less time and support for kids who start off behind and struggle to catch up. In the 1960s and 70s, parents with different income and educational achievement levels were all spending similar amounts of time reading to their children. But over time, a gap emerged. Dr. Putnam and his team have looked at what they call diaper time. When parents address the immediate needs of their young children, and they've also looked at what they call good night moon time, when they talk, read, and interact with their kids. I love this because that book was very big in our house. Now the research shows that everyone does diaper time. You have to. <laughs> or the very least that will happen is the baby will keep crying. But parents with lower income, less education, who struggle to work two jobs with few benefits or flexibility, many of them single moms, parents without strong support networks, they are spending significantly less good night moon time each day than more affluent families and less than parents in comparable positions did 30 and 40 years ago. This lost time adds up. Children build their vocabularies by listening to and interacting with their parents and caregivers. And by age three, children from low-income families with less good night moon time have learned, on average, half as many words as children from middle and upper income families. So that by the time they enter school, they have substantially smaller vocabularies than many of their classmates. Experts call this the word gap. In addition, the new brain research is showing how growing up with the stresses of poverty can damage the development of the prefrontal cortex, which is associated with the ability to pay attention, exhibit self-control, organize, and plan. Among those born in 2001, only 48% of poor children started school ready to learn compared to 75% of children from middle income families. And this disadvantage leads to further disparities in achievement and success over time and even to lower earnings and lower family stability 20 and 30 years later. Now we all agree that every child deserves the best possible chance at success in America. But we are seeing a cycle of economic pressure and inequality that will make it harder and harder as the years go by for millions of American children to succeed in school and in life. And these children are telling us in their own ways what we need to do. 
Now, when I was working with the doctors at the hospital, I also volunteered at the New Haven Legal Services, and I saw a lot of real-world examples that made a big impression on me and helped me decide that I wanted to wage legal battles on behalf of poor and broken families. But person by person, family by family, it just wasn't enough. I grew up in a family that prized self-reliance. We were surrounded by friends, neighbors, church leaders, community members, all of whom really believed how important it was to support the next generation. But at the Legal Services Office here in New Haven, I met too many people, children and adult alike, who didn't have that web of support. And it struck me that somehow we have to recreate that web. We have to be there with that concern, not just rhetorically, but in practice. Confidence in our most important institutions has fallen to historic lows. Polls show Americans losing faith in the press, in banks, in sports heroes, in religion, and of course, in Washington. Yet think about our democracy. Trust is the thread that weaves together our social fabric. The lessons that I learned here and the tools I acquired by attending law school has made me even more determined that we have to try to reverse these trends for our sake, not just the sake of those who are being left behind and left out. So at the Clinton Foundation, where I'm working with Bill and Chelsea, we're taking on this word gap. We're partnering with uh, the Next Generation Foundation, and we've launched a campaign called Too Small to Fail. And we're going to try to use social media. We're going to try to work with businesses. We understand that we're not going to get a new program of some kind from Congress right now, but there's a lot we can do even without that, and to build support and understanding of the importance. So we will be conducting public action and social media campaigns. And we will be working to try to raise the visibility of this issue. Now, when I talk about too small to fail or the word gap, a lot of very well-meaning, concerned people think it's somebody else's job I think it has to be somebody else's job. But I think it's all of our job. I think it is what we have to do now to try to reverse this tide of inequality that is eating away at the social fabric of our country. And yet, at the same time, I am confident we can. It's a serious problem with very large consequences, but it's one we know what to do to address. I remember a long conversation that I had back at Yale in the midst of all the turmoil. The world did seem to be coming apart, and Kids we had grown up with were dying in Vietnam. We had the eight Black Panthers on trial in the courthouse off the green. Thousands of angry protesters filled the streets of the city. Four students at Kent State in May of 1970 were shot dead by National Guard troops. So it was a distressing difficult time. But in 1971, I was fortunate enough to share a dorm room with a young woman from Burma, who I think is here, named Kwan Kwan Tan. She later married another classmate, Bill Wong. She was smart, she was beautiful, she was a great dancer. I had never been anywhere like Asia in my life. It seemed very far away. 
And I asked her, why would you come here? Why would you want to be at Yale Law School at this time? Well, she came for the same reason people still come, by the millions, and even more wanting to come, because she still saw the opportunity and the freedom, the place to get the best education in the world or to start a business or express an opinion or pursue a dream. And so when I knew I was going to Burma as part of our effort to open up the country and begin a relationship, I called Kwan Kam and I said, what do you think? She said, it's time. It's time to go. Yes, it had been ruled by a repressive military regime, but they were reaching out and we needed to reciprocate. One of my favorite moments was when I was speaking with one of the Burmese generals who had taken off his uniform and was now the speaker of one of the houses of parliament. And he told me, we have been studying your country, trying to understand how to run a parliament. And I was very proud to hear that. I thought maybe, you know, the law school could run some seminars or something. I said, so you've been having workshops and meeting with people. He said, oh no, we've been watching the West Wing. <laughs> so we get messages out in all kinds of ways. But they looked to us as they try to make some tough decisions, and we need to know the responsibility that comes with that. We have so many blessings right now in our country, even in these difficult times. It's no surprise that students from 118 countries, more than I visited, are represented here. That's because people the world over know that Yale and America is a center for excellence and creativity. I've always felt that way. I remember a conversation with a good friend who asked me, if you could live in any country, in any century, where would it be? And people were talking about, you know, ancient Rome, Victorian England, but honestly, I said then, and I feel it just as strongly today, I would live right now in America. The chances we have to keep moving in the right direction together toward that more perfect union are even greater today than they were 40 years ago. Yes, we have big challenges ahead of us, but we have the ability, if we match it with the will, to meet every challenge we face. It will take all of us working together. It will take not only leaders, but citizens who have to dare greatly and lead boldly, but that's when we're at our best. It's in our DNA. It's what truly are the habits of the heart that de Tocqueville identified so many years ago. Yale is a place that's been around since the beginning, has seen the ups and the downs, some of which I witnessed, but keeps going from strength to strength. That's exactly like the country that has nurtured it all of these years. So I thank you, Yale, for this honor. I thank you for introducing me to the law, to many friends, to my husband. And I thank you for opening my eyes to the world around me in a way that I had never experienced and giving me the opportunity to learn about the contributions I could make. That is the greatest gift of any education, and it is one that I hope is being seized by the students of today and tomorrow. Thank you all very much.